So um, I'm extremely happy to uh, be speaking to you there in Berlin from here where I am at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, on the occasion of your conference, uh, Marks 200. So I'd like to uh, do three things today. Uh, first, to take you with me on a journey from which I myself have just returned to the far right in the United States. That is um, a, a five-year research project coming to know people who uh, don't believe uh, in, in taxes, they don't believe in the government, the federal government, they're highly suspicious of the federal government. Uh, they uh, also uh, don't believe in welfare. Uh, to uh, go to the poor, and they very much enthusiastically embraced Donald Trump. So I'd like to take you with me on that journey. I'd like to tell you what I discovered, and then to, uh, to discuss three concepts from Marx that I came to think of differently in light of this research. So those three things. So um, let me just uh, start uh, by saying that in 2011, I found myself here in a Berkeley in a political bubble of people who are progressive. Uh, we call ourselves a blue state. People vote Democratic, but many are to the left of that. Uh, the whole state is blue. Berkeley campus is blue. Uh, and I didn't know anyone uh, who was a member of the far right because I was in this bubble. It was a geographic bubble in general. In the U.S., it's people on the coasts that vote um, to the left, and it's more educated people that vote to the left. It's people in the heartland in the south who vote to the right and less educated people vote to the right. So I was in this political bubble, a media bubble. I only read kind of uh, the newspapers and magazines that um, uh, tend to interpret things from a left perspective, and an electronic bubble because I would open my laptop and it gave me myself back again. So I was in a bubble. I didn't know anybody on the far right. And I realized that actually the whole United States is divided into bubbles. So I wanted to find a, an enclave, a bubble that was as far right as Berkeley, California is to the left. And to take off my political and moral alarm system and permit myself a great deal of curiosity and interest about the consciousness and experience of people with whom I knew I would have profound differences. And to try and cross what I called an empathy wall, to try and empathize with the people that I knew I would uh, differ from. And uh, where would that be? Well, in the United States, the right wing has grown the fastest and strongest in the South. Um, but where in the South would I go? Well, how about the super South? Um, Mississippi and Louisiana are considered the deep South. And so I wanted to go there to talk to white people because they, they are the, um, the, the vast majority of people on the right, older people. Uh, in the South, and there is also uh, a oil and petrochemical center in Louisiana. So I picked Louisiana, an oil and petrochemical center, where people uh, on the one hand uh, are, live in a highly polluted environment, but on the other hand, they don't believe in government regulation of industry. So they don't believe in regulating the polluters. So that is, I got out of my bubble, 
the progressive bubble went to an equal and opposite one around the town of Lake Charles in Louisiana. That's the state between Texas and <clears throat> Mississippi <clears throat> that looks like a boot, and it's the bottom of the boot. And I took with me um, a red state paradox. And the paradox is this. How could it be that across the entire United States, it is the poorest states, the states with the worst health, the worst schooling, the most disrupted families, the most motor car accidents, the most pollution, the lowest uh, uh, life expectancy are also the states that receive more money from the federal government in aid than they give back to it in tax dollars and revile the federal government. That's the paradox. Look, if you have all these problems, wouldn't you want some help from the government? Well, the far right says no. I found in Louisiana an exaggerated version of the red state paradox. It is the second poorest state in the United States. It has all of those troubling rates of health and family and school, uh, a low life expectancy. 44% of the state's budget comes from the federal government. And yet overwhelmingly in this, everyone in this state leans very far to the right and suspects uh, the federal government. So I thought, perfect. I've taken my alarm system off, and I'm tr open to trying to climb an empathy wall and understand uh, how this paradox could be. What goes on? What do people believe? How do they feel? What have been their experiences? So um, I uh, spent five years uh, interviewing 60 people, some 40 of whom were to the extreme right. And I would go and ask them where they went to school, where they went to church, could we visit the cemetery where their parents were buried in the course of really getting to know them, going out fishing, um, eating gumbo. Uh, they, they love to eat fish. Um, I, I came to really uh, get to know uh, these people, always telling them exactly who I was and where I came from here, Berkeley, California. And I would say to them, look, I'm worried about the big divide. It's getting worse and worse in this country already in 2011. Uh, and uh, they would say, you know, we're worried about it too. But we think it's because you liberals don't understand us and you, you look down on us. Okay, so what did I find? That was the journey, that was the journey. But coming to the second point, what, what was it I found? Um, I found that the best way to understand uh, people on the right was to think of their their uh, beliefs as being um, supported from below by what I call a deep story. So what's a deep story? A deep story is reality as it feels to you um, concerning a salient situation. You take facts out of the deep story. You take moral beliefs out of the deep story. It's just what the feelings that are left. And the objective correlative to those feelings, that is the things that feel true to you as you're feeling those feelings. And we all, left and right, have different deep stories. So the deep story of the right among the people I came to know is this. It has to be told almost like a dream uh, in the form of a metaphor. 
So you are standing in line um, that's leading up a hill. It, it's as if it's a pilgrimage. At the top of the hill is the American dream. And you've been standing in this line for a very long time. And your feet are tired. The people I interviewed hadn't had a raise in two decades. And some of them, their, their uh, income had gone down. So they're waiting in line for this American dream, and the line is not moving. And in the consciousness of the people I came to know on the right, they begrudge nobody. They, they, they're not hateful people. Um, they abide by the rules, standing in line, and they're hardworking. So a sense of deserving. And in the first moment of the right wing deep story, someone seems to be cutting in line. In fact, a number of people. And who would that be? That would be uh, blacks and uh, even oars from their perspective, women, because there are more of them, who by federally mandated affirmative action plans have been given access to jobs that used to be reserved for whites and for men. Another uh, moment in the right wing deep story, there's another line cutter. That would be immigrants who, who weren't born in the United States. And then refugees. And then in their view, even the oil soaked Louisiana brown pelican, who has you know, been very polluted by this oil industry and is uh, dying out, it kind of waddles up and it's cutting in line uh, between the waiter and the American dream. Because many conservatives told me, oh, the liberals um, and progressives, they value animals uh, over people. So all these people seem like line cutters. Then, in another moment of the right wing deep story, there is Barack Obama, the President of the United States, who should be supervising the entire line impartially, seems to be waving to the line cutters. Oh, he's their president. He's helping them. But he's forgotten about me, and I'm going back in line. And in fact, they said, isn't Barack Obama himself a line cutter. Because many people ask me, how could it be that Barack Obama's mother, who was a, not a rich woman, could afford a Harvard education or a Columbia education? Must be something rigged. It must be a secret. It must be some deal that he could get in there. And we couldn't dream of it. So. One uh, set of people are being favored. They're the line cutters. Barack Obama is himself cutting line. And then in, and uh, the, so people in line are moving back. In the final moment of the right wing deep story, someone who is highly educated from a university like Berkeley on a coast like California, very close to that American dream, really at it kind of turns around and says to the right wing line waiter, you ignorant, um, uh, ill-educated, Bible-thumping, uh, racist, homophobic, sexist uh, redneck. And then, you know, that was the tipping point, to be denigrated, you know, one on top of uh, the uh, unfairness, as it's felt in this right-wing sensibility, uh, was just a tipping point. And the idea was, well, I'll get out of line. Uh, this isn't my line. This isn't even my country. It's not fair. And in after four and a half years of doing research in the bayous and small towns of uh, southwest Louisiana. I uh, learned that Donald Trump was coming to 
New Orleans for a primary rally. And suddenly uh, I thought, well, let me go to that. And I went with one of my Tea Party uh, uh, respondents uh, for six hours on the car. And, uh, and we arrived, many excited people, mainly older, uh, almost exclusively white, and very excited about Donald Trump. And you saw the, uh, the Trump plane coming from on high, down, 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 you know, as if he's coming from heaven, from that 1% Richest on down, landing the plane, and um, and he had an electricity uh, because, in a sense, he was the rescuer uh, for those who felt caught in the deep story. He became the deep story president. He said basically, "You're stuck." You're the class, the working class that's been left behind, and all these other groups are being sponsored by the government, and you're being forgotten. I remember you. I'll lift you up. I'll make America great again. And they saw nothing else on the political horizon for them, and so have, have embraced him. Uh, so I felt like I'd been spending a lot of time studying the dry kindling, and on that one day, I saw the match that could light that kindling. So there were many reasons that uh, the people I came to know uh, didn't uh, uh, like the government, distrusted it. One was it seemed like the North that was always wagging its moral fingers uh, at the South. Another, the, the government, the federal government seemed like it would be modeled on a very disappointing state government. And indeed, they were right to be very suspicious of the Louisiana state government since it was very much an, uh, the creature of the oil industry. In other words, the oil industry outsourced the moral dirty work to state officials. So the state officials uh, were assigned the job of promising citizens in, in the state, we're going to protect you from environmental pollution. And then they didn't do it. And so people came to have affection for the oil companies that they thought were bringing jobs and looked down on the state officials that were not doing what the tax dollars given them uh, were supposed to be doing. So that was a second reason that these uh, right-wingers didn't, didn't uh, trust the federal government. And the third was they saw the federal, they saw the federal government as an instrument of the line cutters. So government is an instrument of the North, instrument of inept uh, public officials, and an instrument of the line cutters in the deep story. And for all those reasons together, uh, they, uh, they felt strongly that the government had been an instrument uh, for the protection of the wrong uh, social class, the very poor and the very rich, and left them out. So uh, the red state paradox, they knew about it, they didn't care about it. The deep story was, was uh, for them the real story. So I ended my research uh, by saying, okay, now I think I understand uh, how, what their consciousness is, how the world looks to them. And that's an answer to the red state paradox. But what I really find uh, I'm left with was a blue state paradox. And that is this. 
um, how could it be that the Democratic Party, uh, the party supposedly of the working man and the working woman, had absolutely no appeal for these working men and these uh, working women? That was the blue state paradox that my book, Strangers in Their Own Land, uh, Anger and Mourning on the American Right, delivers to the audience. That's the question it uh, ends with. Now, uh, so that was the journey I've been on, and those were my uh, findings. But I'd like to now turn to the third thing, which is um, how uh, it made me think, this journey made me think differently about uh, various ideas we find in Marx. The first is uh, false consciousness. In a sense, uh, I think the, the red state paradox is an instance of false consciousness. I mean, if people really need government help, why don't they want it? And why are they, in a way, blaming government and not industry? But, you know, I don't like the word false because it presumes that um, those people I went to study, uh, they're wrong, and me, I'm right, I know it's right. I prefer the word circumstantial consciousness. That is a consciousness which is informed by local circumstances. And so self-interest is defined by those circumstances. Um, and in some ways, if, I, if we ask, did these people have false consciousness? It's a mixed story. On one hand, they didn't have false consciousness because they are very suspicious of neoliberalism, of, of global uh, uh, arrangements between globe-tropping multinationals. They felt that uh, those arrangements uh, had made life harder for them as working class and lower middle class uh, residents. And they're right. They're right. The companies that they worked for, and these were pipe fitters, and um, uh, they worked out on oil rigs. Uh, so they had high school educations, uh, most of them. Uh, these were jobs that uh, either came or went depending on the price of oil, and they worked for companies that could uh, leave just uh, offshore and find, uh, 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 relocate uh, in a uh, near a cheaper uh, labor pool. So they were right in a sense. Um, to see a, con a, a, a conflict between the social class they were born in and the social class uh, whose interests were served by neoliberal policies. Um, and they, um, but they also feared, and the deep story tells us this, that women and blacks were the real ones that were uh, competing with them. And the, in a sense, the positional identities of women and blacks, uh, they, they were focusing on that, not looking at the poor who were behind them in line, but identifying with the super rich, the one percent, the American dream, and uh, understanding these groups as an obstacle. So. In one sense, you could say that there, uh, there has been some competition introduced by these groups, but uh, basically, if you uh, look at the progress of blacks over the last 30 years, it hasn't changed really at all in the proportion of, um, uh, or 
or, or not substantially, uh, proportion of blacks who are in higher education or in um, high status jobs. And uh, there's a big pay gap between men and women. So while women are more in the labor force, they haven't risen up a whole lot. And at the moment, immigrants, which are another identity they uh, feel competitive with, uh, there are more immigrants leaving than there are coming in the United States right now. So we get a mixed story here as to whether this is false consciousness. Uh, or not. But it's not mixed when we ask the question, does their, uh, does President Trump, who, who they think does represent their interest, are his policies really helping the working class, the left out, forgotten class in the United States? And the answer to that is, for all the talk, no. Donald Trump is bringing back to them uh, yesterday, the good jobs of yesterday, the social norms of yesterday. He wants uh, more coal miners, and he wants to restore uh, jobs to the oil rigs and to um, manufacturing. But what's really happening is that all of those jobs are being automated or they're going out, and new jobs uh, are coming up for which we need job retraining. And in his preferred uh, federal budget, Donald Trump wanted to cut funding for job retraining. In other words, he's not looking at the jobs of tomorrow and the effect of automation on the jobs of tomorrow. So uh, is, uh, is their chosen deep story leader going to lead them out of their problems? The answer is no. Um, so a second point that uh, this journey made me think about is uh, something downplayed very much by Marx, and I'm not the first to say this, which is the identity of uh, 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 attached to gender and to race. In other words, we have social class identity, and that took primacy for Marx. But I think we really have to look at the impact of gender and race. And since much has been written about race, let me just say this about gender, that uh, there is in the United States today, I would say, a crisis in manhood, a crisis for men. Um, if we look at the proportion of young uh, boys and girls in primary school and secondary school, the girls are doing much better and the boys are doing much worse. If we look at uh, who applies to college or university. Now, it's something like 59% of all college students are women and 40-some uh, percent of men. That didn't used to be true. And if we look at the proportion of, uh, of people who are getting advanced degrees, master's degrees, and doctoral degrees, if we look at the proportion of entering students in medical schools uh, and, and in law schools, a uh, higher proportion of women uh, are there than men. And we have to ask, well, what is going on with these men? A um, higher proportion uh, are obese, uh, have drug addiction problems. Fewer men have driver's licenses than, than women. In fact, I didn't know earlier. So I think much of this can be explained by the, um, the whole fate of the forgotten working and lower middle class, and that's just the class that is turning to the right. But with it, then, is this crisis in manhood. What is it to be a man? There were many other social trends that are making 
men feel less uh, lodged in a honorable job and less lodged uh, in a stable uh, marriage or relationship and uh, more, more at sea. So we have to look not only at a person's social class location, but their gender location and their ethnic location. And to become curious about the dislocations that are affecting people, uh, uh, men and ethnic minorities. So I guess the third and last point uh, that uh, my uh, research for my book has made me wonder about is why there is a rise across the world of the right, that is, of people who increasingly identify with their ethnic group and their nation and who shy away from an identification, say, of with the working class or an identification with international organizations. Why this move to ethnic identity and national identity? What's going on? In other words, the people I came to know in the bayous of southern Louisiana were part of what looks like a global response to neoliberalism over the last three decades. As companies have become more powerful than governments, and in fact governments are on bended knee trying to persuade a company to invest its money and infrastructure in one state or another, uh, or one country in another, um, the companies can move uh, and have gotten far bigger and richer than many of the states that uh, compete to have them come. I'll give you one example of this competition. Louisiana paid $1.6 billion to a group of six or seven companies, please come and settle here. Don't go over to Texas. Uh, you know, make your investment here so that we can have jobs. Ironically, there were very few jobs attached to uh, uh, these investments, but a huge amount of money was given to the companies uh, just uh, to pay them for coming. So there's a new rearrangement of power. Companies have more, states have less, and the social class that would benefit from these company investments uh, is the working class is losing out. So I think in this instance, we have to look at individuals search for what I would call structural security. If we look over the last 30 years, it used to be that a company offered you uh, stability. You joined the company, you had a membership in the company, you felt affiliated to the company. You may have hated that company. It might not have been nice to you, but you felt a structural security from your membership in a workforce for that company or the labor movement that was bargaining with that company. Those were two anchors that gave you a structural security. And we've moved from a period, you know, in, in a post-war period, the 40s, 50s, 60s, where there was a stable workplace and a stable labor uh, union to go with it. Uh, and two, a new situation of precarity, where you might have a good job but you today, but you might not have it tomorrow. And in this new situation of precarity, we have a very tiny labor movement now. Fewer than 12% are uh, now uh, 
uh, represented by unions and in the private sector, even less than that. Um, so in the new situation, you don't have a stable company you work for and a stable union that's getting you better deal with that company. You have, you have lost a certain kind of structural security that you got from your attachment to that. So I think we are a community-seeking, security-seeking uh, species. And we're like a hive of bees that have lost our hive and are kind of uh, looking for a new hive. You know, the old hive doesn't work. Old hive of the steady uh, company and steady uh, uh, labor union. We're looking for a new hive, and I think looking in a number of different places. I think the uh, people are finding community in a workplace. In other words, uh, a group of 40 workers will rent a, uh, a warehouse and all come to work and work on their computers there. They all work for different companies, but they find community with co-workers. So not through their identity as a, as a common laborers for a particular company, but as a common residence of a workplace. That's one new hive people are uh, moving toward. Another are the mega churches, large churches. And uh, I think that's another kind of a hive through which people are finding a kind of existential security. And many of these churches have taken on many other functions of child care and marriage counseling, and they have gyms. It's kind of a, um, uh, a little life world uh, that is an alternate hive. But a third and troubling way in which people are seeking community and affiliation is through their identity as a member of an ethnic group and, it, and nation. So I think there's a connection between uh, neoliberalism as a, as a policy, the loss of steady workplaces and steady unions, and the rise of the right. So those are the three thoughts that I had as a result of this um, journey uh, to the far right, and uh, I'm happy to share them with you. Thank you.